Do you ever feel like everything around you is completely empty? That talking to other people often just leaves an even deeper pit of loneliness inside of you? That the best years of your life have gone by and that you're just toiling away living the most mundane, meaningless and routine days of your existence yet? And that all of this is just becoming your new normality and the hope of something changing is constantly getting smaller and moving further away from you? Well, this is exactly what Nyayasnaya is about. In recent years, there's been an uprise on sites like Pinterest and TikTok of this peculiar romanticization of ex-Soviet era architecture and in general of this post-Soviet melancholy vibe. It's something I have mixed feelings about coming from a formerly Soviet country myself. On the one side, the main heritage of the Soviet era is mostly misery, so not much to romanticize there. <laughs> On the other, I kind of understand the general fascination with this whole aesthetic. There is a special word in Russian that many have deemed untranslatable. And it's very central to the game we'll be analyzing today. It's Taska. The Ushakov dictionary defines it as intense inner languor, inner disquiet combined with sadness and boredom. And here I use inner because the original word is dushevnaya which is used in both a mental and emotional sense, but also in a spiritual one, seeing as it comes from dusha, dusha. which literally means soul. In short, Aska describes a specific feeling of melancholy that is deeply embedded in the Russian tradition. It's a kind of cold emptiness, and an anxiety for both the past years of your life and the upcoming future. A directionless loneliness, if you will. There are many people who think that this whole untranslatability rhetoric is deceptive, that Taska is just a word with a broad meaning that can be translated with no issues, that there is nothing special or magical about it. And to these people I ask, why are you so cynical? Of course we can look at language from a frigid and scientific point of view, and in that sense, yes, we can technically translate anything, whether it be through a periphrasis, a calc, or a neologism. But at that point, let's just leave the translation of poetry to ChatGPT. In fact, why write poetry at all if words are such simple and sterile things? If any of you have ever tried to translate poetry or ever appreciated it at all, you'll immediately know what I mean. Words do have a special depth that goes beyond that which can be scientifically described. Daska is an emotional and spiritual state that is tied to the bitter cold of the land, to historical misery, to the collective soul that has been through different terrible eras and has come out on the other side surrounded by bleak grey commie blocks, terrible infrastructure, poverty, addiction and depression. So when somebody says that anyone can feel it, I say sure, but they're not gonna use that word to describe it if they're not Russian speakers, especially native ones. You wouldn't throw around the word saudade if you weren't Portuguese or Brazilian, right? This is all very important for today's video, because Nyayasne is a game that completely revolves around poetry and taska. It honestly feels weird to call it a game, because just like every other thing developed by said 3 d it's a very specific life experience shown through the medium of video game. I know, it sounds incredibly pretentious when I say it like that, and many might say that it's just a glorified walking simulator. But outside of the fact that the term walking simulator used to be derogatory and even now, while it's often taken more seriously, it doesn't accurately describe many of the games in this genre. Nyasne goes out of its way to implement some classic video gamey mechanics while rendering them completely useless at the same time. The point of calling a game a walking simulator nowadays is usually that of stressing the fact that the main focus is not going to be the gameplay but more so the story, characters, atmosphere, art style, etc. In this sense, yeah, it does fit. 
What makes it so special though, in my opinion, is precisely the fact that it's more of a Tusca simulator. It's one of the best ways that a non-Eastern European person can truly understand what that inner state of being feels like. And this is also where I kind of understand the fascination with this whole vibe, because it evokes those same emotions. There is, admittedly, something peculiar about melancholy feelings. They don't feel nice in the normal sense, but they do feel deep, real, or even poetic. Ironically, that kind of depth, though it's born out of sadness, can make us feel more alive, especially if we usually struggle with it. What I especially appreciate about Nyasne is that it's not just simply about sadness. This Tasca is a pervasive starting point, but the game is more about finding the poetry in the sadness and about how intense aesthetic experiences can, if not completely change how we perceive things, at least allow us to escape from the void of the mundane, rekindling bit by bit what little hope we might still have left. It's quite a short experience and you can pretty much find everything there is to find in it, even on your first playthrough. But its atmosphere keeps you coming back, at least it did so with me. I wanted to keep thinking about this game. I wanted to re-experience it in a similar way in which one can read and reread a poem. The words are there, on the page, and they're always the same, but every time you read it, you might think, feel, and understand something different. Nyasne is divided in four main levels, which correspond to four different places you can visit and just absorb for a while. There is apparently no real objective, and you can probably beat it in like 10 minutes if you just run through. Obviously, the real objective is to experience the atmosphere, to linger, think, and most importantly, to get inspired. Part 1. The Suburb We begin alongside some commie blocks, probably having just exited our padiest to go for a night out and we'll immediately notice how the buildings are all kinda crooked and imperfect. This will be one of the main metaphors in the game, things and spaces having weird crooked shapes. Maybe it's to accentuate the character's perceived ugliness of these places, to make them almost look like something alien and nauseating, even though they're a part of everyday life. Obviously, everyone will experience things in this game at their own pace, and I'm gonna show you everything in the order that I experienced it in. I really suggest that you go and give this game a try and support the developer. Your emotional involvement will be much deeper if you play it for yourself, without me spoiling everything. One of the first things we might notice is rats. They're kind of everywhere and they're just hanging around. When we come up to one, we get a prompt to pet him and if we do... Alright, that's strange. We'll come back to this shortly. Another thing that you might notice immediately is the purple windows that we can see in some spots. Now, this is one of those details that show you how faithfully the developer wanted to translate reality into this game. This is a typical thing you might see in coming blocks. People leave UV lamps turned on at night to grow herbs. And it's really cool that he thought of such a small aspect of everyday life in these places. Around us it looks like an endless dusty wasteland, and we can find human bones and even skulls scattered around. This is, again, a pretty on the nose metaphor. It seems that in these kinds of towns people just waste away, and these remains remind our character that he's going to experience the same fate. A sort of memento mori. The first really interesting place we encounter is this building with a big old neon sign that reads MFC which stands for... Alright, I'm gonna try. Многофункциональный центр предоставления государственных и муниципальных услуг. Which is pretty much a government facility in which you go to get your documents and stuff like that. It's probably meant to be the first spot you go to, because on the walls we get some tutorial messages. Like how to turn on our flashlight and open our skill menu. Wait, skill menu? Okay, let's read the skills. Loneliness, corporeality, reflection. These seem really useful. Remember how I said that the game implements some classic video gamey mechanics while making them completely pointless? Well, this is one of them. At first you might think that there's some RPG elements here, just like with the rat plague thing, but 
Nope. These stats serve no gameplay purpose. That I know of, at least. Maybe I'm just a brain lead. They're more of an extra diegetic indicator of what our character feels. And the way they're used is very clever, in my opinion. Even the flashlight mechanic might perhaps make you think that there is some horror element to the game and, well, this is not a horror game. At least not in the usual sense. The horror here is all existential, which is arguably worse, because it's real. The last mechanic we see is... Smoking. Oh! Yep. There's a button dedicated to just lighting up a cigarette and smoking it, with no limits and no purpose except giving us a one-plus in corporeality. Some might look at this and immediately wrinkle their nose, thinking this is just a pretentious sad boy doomer simulator, but in my opinion there is a deeper purpose to this mechanic, which I'll tell you later down the road. In this building we meet a security guard who's half asleep, surrounded by cigarette butts and beers. When we try to interact with him, he just makes this noise. Telling us access denied. Nothing more. We can also drink his beers, which makes our character drunk. And if we drink enough of them, it makes him really drunk. Making the game almost impossible to control. You'll probably also notice at this point that we can pick up and throw objects around. Again, this mechanic is basically pointless, except for finding hidden easter eggs in the form of interactive duck plushies by stacking some boxes or barrels. We can go up to this machine to get our ticket, but it too says access denied. It's obviously late, so it would be weird if this government facility was still operating, but there's more. At the end of the room there are three doors that should supposedly take us to the office of an operator. But instead, we get inside a very crooked hallway with another door at the end, and then we're spit right outside of another random building. The first one puts us in front of a club, the second outside of a kebab place, and the third just some other building. This is something you'll notice in the first two levels. Space doesn't connect in a logical way. Doors seem to take you to completely different places as opposed to the ones you'd normally expect, which in this case, along with the crooked hallways, really accentuates that feeling of nausea I've already mentioned. More than that, what's really interesting here to me is the presence of an important metaphor. This is a government facility, which should supposedly help you in some way, but what do we get? Access denied, and then just random hallways that take us nowhere. I think it's pretty obvious what the developer is trying to tell us here. The government is completely inefficient and doesn't even try to help its citizens. It almost feels like it's actually fooling them by putting aimless systems in place, infinite queues and just outright stupid rules. So we can't count on it at all. That which is supposed to help a country operate smoothly seems to just be a big joke in Eastern Europe. And if any of you live or have lived there, you'll probably immediately get it. Outside of the aforementioned club, we can meet what I assume to be an old friend or acquaintance. This is what he tells us. Привет. Чё, как дела у тебя? Опять без новостей? Да что ж такое с тобой? Снова хмурые мысли в голове. Знаешь, жизнь так быстро летит. Ты главное о будущем не думай, и все получится. Давай удачи. It pretty much sums up perfectly the main feelings we'll get in the game. This guy's solution is just to not think about the future. That's the only way not to get lost in our gloomy thoughts. He then just keeps saying, "Yo." Also, when we're finished talking to him, we get a plus one in loneliness. You'll notice that this is what usually happens when you talk to people in the game, even though you'd normally expect to feel less lonely when you talk to others. This is one of the ways in which the use of stats is clever. The message is loud and clear, and pretty relatable if you ask me. Sometimes it truly does feel like interacting with others just makes you feel like you're even further away from them than before. It's like there's no real dialogue among you, everything is just surface level. Like you could do just as well without it, although you can't seem to stop because humans are social animals at the end of the day. We can get ready to enter by drinking more suspicious beverages that we find lying around. 
Before going in, there's something interesting about this club. It's called Alco Aptieka. Alco as in alcohol, and Aptieka means pharmacy. As you can see, the sign is also a cross with a bottle in the middle. Keep this in mind. We get in and look, there's music and people are dancing their heads off. Pretty cool. At the first table to our right, we can meet another old friend, who immediately tells us stuff that is the opposite of what our friend outside told us, but just as depressing. So this time again, we're reminded of our future, about how someone else that we knew actually made it and how we should get a move on and think about what we're gonna do. These two characters plant an uncomfortable seed in our head. What is our future? And what are we even doing right now? Maybe it's too early to tell at this point, but we'll see that we'll have to think about it some more later down the road. So the etiquette at this point is obviously to just get smashed like never before and dance our problems away while rolling around like a maniac. And by the way, if we don't drink at least one glass of something, our character won't start dancing, which is also pretty on the nose. When the game comes down and gives us the controls back, we can progress to the following room. So, remember how the place is called Alco Pharmacy? <laughs> well, here's the pharmacy part. Here we can measure our blood pressure, which for the times I did it, it seems always pretty normal, although slightly high. Its purpose is, I think, don't take my word for it, I'm just speculating, to indicate that we're actually in normal health and that any problems we have come from a psychological point of view. So what do we do? Well, of course we get some random pills from the pharmacist and eat them in one gulp, which gives us a plus one reflection. Just like we can eat these chips and just like we can drink these beers. So think about this for a second. The pharmacy is in the back of a nightclub and it sells medicine along with junk food, alcohol and cigarettes. We might have our second big commentary from the author here. It could be interpreted as the medical system being just as useless as the government, and that medicines are being fed to the population like any other harmful addiction inducing drug, drink or food. It also raises a question, if you live in a place like this and are depressed or struggle with mental health in other ways, are you really the problem? Is a bottle of pills going to turn this bleak reality into something livable? Well, the pills do give us one point of reflection, as I said, but again, the stats are useless. I think the game will offer us a different possibility in a later level. The only other interior we can go in is this kebab place, which obviously also sells tobacco and alcohol. And in here you can't really do much except absorb the atmosphere and eat a nice big kebab. It's again another detail that adds to the realness of this virtual space. At this point we can just run around and see what else we might find. We can meet this trio of young gentlemen, which my grandpa would have called a bunch of barbosa. They're just walking around, blasting music from their speakers and watching TikToks, I guess. Por, por. If you interact with one of them, he'll constantly tell you to not get sick and that they're just hanging out. And more interestingly, that Tima is looking for the light. Sometimes it's we are looking for the light. What light is he talking about? Keep these guys in mind, because we might just meet them again. We can also go around admiring all the trash strewn all over, an old rusty tractor, random metal debris, walk around some garages from which we can hear music, we can try to interact with a phone that's locked, pet some more rats, and there's a rat with sneakers. A goddamn rat with goddamn sneakers. Is it? Is it a reflection of us, perchance? Very deep. 
we can then get mad at these cars going around way too fast and blasting music way too damn loud, read some graffiti, like the developer's Instagram, another one, and this one saying, I'm sorry that it all happened this way. And this, your mom is proud of you. Aw, thanks. We can also go up to this very detailed kiosk which just spits out a packet of chips. If you've ever bought anything from a place like this, then you know how accurate this kind of treatment is. At the bus stop, just to the side, you can find another phone, and this one we can actually open, almost as if it's ours. But what is it doing lying here? Well, anyway, we can read a message. Our only Ilya is on tonight. An invitation to go to the city, at the old brewery. Something is gonna happen. So, at this point we can get inside the bus, where we find this trusty fella looking at TikToks. When we interact with him, he just gives us twitchy silence. The bus itself is, well, you can see it for yourself. Again, nausea, crooked spaces, etc. Crouching, we can get to the back of the bus, touch the symbol and... Level complete. So, before going forward, what have we gathered up to this point? The world we live in is bleak and grey. The people we talk to make us feel even more lonely. We can get pills, and we're not even shown if we have a prescription or not. The medical system itself and the government seem like empty, sad jokes. Some kids are looking for the light. And we might have the plague. Drinking, eating junk food and smoking all have effects on our stats, but our stats seem to be completely useless. Also, we might have picked up what I hope is our phone, where somebody's inviting us to some kind of event at the old brewery. From the wording, it seems like some sort of concert or play. We'll see. Let's move on. Maybe in town we'll find something more. Maybe we'll feel less lonely. Part 2. Round Square In the next part, the Round Square, we get off the bus and find ourselves in the city. The first thing we see is the bus stop, with, what a surprise, more garbage and cigarette butts lying around. Welcoming to say the least. If we didn't feel depressed enough, This time there's also some light rain to help us hide our tears. Sounds quite calming though, I gotta admit. At the bus stop we can also notice a poster saying, guess what? Tosca. Although it's probably referring to the Italian opera by Puccini, Tosca. Because it looks like a theater or a movie poster. Still, it's obviously intentional seeing as in Russian the word is the same. As if everything wasn't sad enough already, we can also see that someone lost their cat. We can go to the square, bumping into people and... Let's just say that it doesn't seem like the townsfolk will make us feel any better. Especially this guy that's surprised at how crooked we've become. Thanks, man. Another dude just asks us if we want some kombucha. Alright. Running around, we get approached by a girl. She just asks us if we could buy her a blazer, out of all things. We obviously tell her to fuck off, so she goes back to her friend, defeated. We can also see the entrance of a club, Sigmoid. I'm not gonna make jokes about the name. But here we find a dude that's ready to throw hands for some reason. And the woman beside him just tells us that we can get in without an invitation. Well, alright, keep your secrets. We can also follow the different roads up to the map limit where we'll once again get some text. One says, you can't be here, the grass is always greener on the other side, etc. It's a strange feeling because as opposed to the previous level, this time we can actually see other places and buildings, so we might really want to explore. But the limit is jarring and reminds us that we have nowhere to run, wherever we might find ourselves. We can also notice this strange sign saying Electro Items, Synthesis, Isotopes. Interesting. Let's go in and see what it's all about. We enter a dirty old podiest covered in graffiti. I didn't notice this the first time around, but there are some QR codes all over the place. So you might wonder, do they work? Yes. What do they take us to? Just one word. Hui. That's some advanced shitposting, man. Going up the stairs, we can find a dude working on some electronic parts, probably the reason for the sign outside, and this man sitting on the stairs and smoking a cigarette, and... yep, this guy seems to have a robotic eye. That's out of left field to say the least. When we interact with him, this is what he says. 
все заебало. Очень и очень сильно заебало. Дождь хлещет улицу. Все листья уже на земле. Беспощадная ночь. So the usual depressing shtick. If we speak with the other man instead, from his words we can gather something interesting about ourselves. Ну чё, как твои аугментации? Не ноют на погоду? Может, тебя немного подпаять? Да шучу, шучу. Ты вообще знаешь, как твое тело теперь работает? Да тебя это не волнует, я уж понял. Apparently these electronic augmentations are normal in this world, and it seems like we ourselves got some augmentations. I never asked for this. It's quite a strange thing to add into the game, giving us a little cyberpunk vibe. It was probably just a cool addition to the game world, but obviously there is a deeper reason for it. I think it's similar to what we've seen with the pills. These augmentations are supposed to improve us in some way, and he asks us if we even know how they work, but our character doesn't care, it's all pointless to him. We can infer that the cyborg parts haven't made our life better at all. This point is reinforced by the fact that we can't use them at all in-game. Let's go back outside. Seems like I missed a couple of graffiti. One is taska taska taska. I mean, could it be clearer at this point? And also this one, which basically means something like will go great with a beer or it will pair well with a beer. Is it talking about our sadness? I agree, nothing better than crying in a pint. Another place we can enter is this cramped little bookstore. As soon as we get in, we can speak with the clerk. Вот это прикол! Who starts saying some weird stuff, dog? Хороший выбор. Хорошее направление. Скобки – это текстовые облака. Этот текст – это комикс без картинок. Then just switches voice and gets even weirder. Сгустки концепции внутри текста, воздушные сгустки, содержащие невидимых жителей, сгустки ночи, сгустки отношений, сгустки идейные, мыслимые, допустимые, формировали все воспринимаемое, то, на чем можно останавливаться, как островки и суши среди болота, в котором тонет восприятие. All right, you crazy woman, calm down. So this is a good moment to mention that besides Sad 3D or Ignatov, Ilya Mazo also worked on the game, and I think he's behind some of the poetry-related stuff, seeing as he's a poet, you know? So dialogues like this and some of the poems we'll find in this store might be his doing. I'm not going to analyze the poetry because I think it's abstract enough for you to really think about it yourself and see where it leads your thoughts. And it's also kind of meta, but I don't think it reveals to us anything concrete about the game. I will say though that the idea of seeing everything as made of clots is pretty telling, I think. The last thing she asks us when we interact with her is, why are you running away? Well, mind your own business, you weirdo. Anyway, in the store we can find different books lying around. Some are just short poems, which I'm guessing come from Ilya Mazo, or the developer. We can also find Dante's first canto, which is really fitting. As many of you might know, at the start of the comedy, Dante finds himself completely lost in a dark forest. The forest essentially symbolizes the state of sin that Dante and really all of us at some point in our lives end up in. Just as he sees the sunlight behind a hill and thinks he's found a way out, he's blocked by three beasts. Allegories, again, that I'm not going to sit here and explain in depth because this is not a video about the comedy, but in short, they represent three capital sins. Lust, pride and greed. Anyway, what matters is that in order to finally get out of the forest and to purify himself of sin, Dante will need to quite literally traverse hell from top to bottom, and then purgatory from bottom to top, with the aid of the classical poet Virgil, who essentially represents reason. Just read the comedy, it's basically the most important poem in all of western culture. 
I think it's no mistake that this is one of the first books that we can find here. Our character is obviously quite lost himself, and as we've seen, he's not one to shy away from sinful activities. It could quite simply mean that he's going through hell too, trying to find the other side. Maybe the poetry we encounter is similarly to Virgil, the aid that should get us out of here. The most important thing that Dante needs to do is not lose faith, and he ends up quite literally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe I'm reading way too deep in here, but I would say so far that, if nothing else, our character needs some faith, or better put, some hope. We find other poems and chapters by people like Turgenev and Lermontov, who unfortunately I'm not as familiar with as I am with Dante, and I kinda don't want to spoil them for myself by reading snippets here, but if any of you find some parallels and metaphors for the game, please tell me. So yeah, books are cool, but there's more things in life, like petting this cat the whole fucking night. In a recent update, they randomly added this cute little fella, and petting it is one of the only two interactions that gave us a minus one in loneliness. Exactly the same effect as in real life, if you ask me. If we take this door, we find ourselves in a spiral staircase. Every floor has a door, and they all lead to other places of the map. It's kind of like a hub. Remember what I said about space connecting in an illogical way? Yeah. One door leads to the bookstore, one to the cyborg guy, one outside, and the bottom one leads to the brewery where we need to go to end the level. The top one, though, leads to the attic of a building. Here we can find a mini fridge, a chair, a light, and other objects. Obviously, someone has been chilling here. We also find a radio in which a broadcast from Radio Echo tells us random weird informations, and during the breaks plays a waltz. I'm not gonna sit here and translate them, but just to give you an idea, there's something about bears attacking people, about some guy selling his company for some music album or finding his new artistic calling, something about bodies being found after an incident at work, also something about a wife hitting her husband with a meat tenderizer, it's all quite funny because it's mostly ironic and surreal, but not that relevant to us. We can get out on the very top of the building and look at the city skyline and at the plaza that we came from. You might have noticed the red neon signs on these two buildings. We can see that they spell out Ust Živjot, which basically means let him live or may he live or she or it. So what would any of us try at this point? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. <laughs> If we try to get off the building in the parkour way, the game immediately sends us back. It seems like there is truly no escape, just like the map limits tell us. So at this point, seeing as there's nothing more to do, we can just go to our objective. We get to the bottom of the spiral stairwell and see this dude snoozing on the ground with a prompt telling us to let him sleep. All right, sleep tight, brother. We got stuff to do and people to meet. We get down to the old brewery and see this man sitting at a table. He tells us, "Так давно тебя здесь не было. Мы уже все соскучились. Сегодня наш поэт выступает. Сейчас уже все начнется." And surprisingly, we get a minus one in loneliness again. This might be the only nice interaction with another person that we can have in the game. We also finally find out what is on tonight. It's a poetry reading from our friend Ilya, so probably Ilya Mazo himself. Without any more waiting around, we get into the place, and the level ends. Part 3. Brewery. So, from this point on, there isn't really that much to do in the game. And this level especially is the smallest one but probably also one of the most meaningful. We enter a sort of little art gallery and can observe these nice pixelated paintings. We come across a girl with cat ears who greets us with a... Um, okay, let us proceed. We get down and see a small stage with people sitting in front of it. There's some music playing from the speaker. Suddenly, one guy stands up and moves towards the stage. This must be our Ilya. He reads a poem.
quite nice. Again, I'm not gonna analyze it too deeply here, and I don't want to sway your impressions of it too much. But obviously there is an element of time passing, of getting older, going towards one's autumn. And the phrase, what a beautiful life you gave me, together with the mention of angels with strollers, is obviously directed towards mothers or motherhood. I think that our poet feels similar to how we feel, but seems to have accepted that life keeps going, and that everyone gets older and sees the world with new eyes. Maybe his boy eyes weren't yet ready to see the depth of the world. And maybe he's learning, but these are just my own two cents. Everyone gets up and goes outside. There is a cute little area with tables and lights, which looks like every self-managed venue ever. Here we can listen in to some people's conversations. There's these two guys. Где купим сигареты? Знаешь, я ненавижу свою жизнь. Okay. Then they talk about some other dude who's a promising young lad who went to study philosophy. And then one of them asks this. Ну, как твои впечатления? Я думаю, что тут не всё так просто, Вася. В прошлый раз всё было по-настоящему. Мы были искренними, хохотали, и стихи были значительными и полными. Никаких двухсмысленностей и напряжения, как теперь. So this, along with what Ilya said in his poem and other interactions we've had in the game, really points for me to the theme of aging. Mainly in the sense of your childhood or your teenage years ending. There's obviously some mentions about the future, about getting a job and doing something useful. And these guys too. Has the quality of the poems actually changed? Or are they just getting older and everything starts to seem more complex and life is becoming harder? Maybe they have more weight on their hearts and on their shoulders. That's why they can't enjoy this evening as they used to before. Then there's these two girls asking if they're still human. Then they talk about one of their relationships. Не могу больше лгать. Он все чаще и чаще говорит со мной, как с сумасшедшей. Ты не поверишь, он настаивает на том, что я никогда не смогу жить с человеком, которого люблю. У меня ощущение, будто он пытается меня во всем ограничить, сделать послушной куклой. Он не понимает, что девушки просто хотят радоваться жизни. Here the better translation would be, girls just want to enjoy life. But I guess the Cindy Lauper reference was too good to pass on. So yeah, it's like everybody here is just, you know, pretty dang depressed. Up here we also have a duck plushie. We can also talk to our poet man himself. This is what he tells us. Я так рад тебя видеть. Рад, что ты пришел. Оглянись, скажи, ты понимаешь, где мы теперь? Это наш последний вечер вместе. Можно написать много стихов, даже очень хороших. Другой вопрос, как их не написать? Вот где загадка. And what do you know, we get a plus one in loneliness again. Well, he does come across as a pretty pretentious dude, not gonna lie. And what he tells us is so vague and kinda useless, I guess. For how we're feeling, it's no surprise. To end the level, we have to go to the stage and collect this symbol, which gives us inspiration. So, this is interesting. You know what I was saying at the start about strong aesthetic experiences helping us through the everyday slog that life can be? This is kind of what I was referencing. It's weird that the guy himself makes us feel even lonelier, but his poem has obviously had some kind of effect on our protagonist. And I'll admit that the atmosphere was just right. And seeing as our character himself is lost at this point of his life, maybe that poem did move something inside of him. After grabbing the symbol, the doors in the courtyard open, and we can finally get out to a starry sky and this vast, dark emptiness. There's also our friendly rats again. I was wondering where they were. If we touch the map limit, we get another message. There is no escape. Thanks. Very uplifting. We can see some floodlights in the distance, so I guess we're going that way. We touch the usual symbol and the level ends.
part 4, Stadium. And so we get to the final level, the darkest and emptiest so far. We see that the floodlights illuminate a small sports stadium, some guy is getting swollen on the pull-up bar, good going. Another man is getting in his nightly cardio, and if we get in his way, he just tells us Бля, не мешай, а? Sorry bro, no need to be an asshole about it. There's also two girls drinking wine and listening to music on a blanket. As everybody else, they're talking about pretty depressing stuff. Я тут подумала, ты знаешь разницу между бессилием и беспомощностью? Нет. А в чем разница между беспомощностью и отчаянием? Я не знаю. Как ты думаешь, все в этом мире приходит к концу? Ну, конечно же. Очень на это надеюсь. Я тоже. Нам ведь уже нечего терять, правда? Боюсь, что да. Not gonna lie, this is literally a normal Friday night for me. There's pretty much nothing else to do. It's just all commie blocks with nothing around, except... What's that? Oh, it's the boys from the first level. They have found the light. Yeah, I can see that. Good for them, I think? At this point we can find a new symbol here, which tells us that our driver will be here in one or two minutes. So, what can we do? Just light up an infinite amount of cigarettes, stand under the only working street light, and think. It's a good moment to really think about everything. Some people will definitely relate to this part. It seems to me like the end of the night kind of situation, in which after a night out with your buddies, you gotta go back home by yourself, maybe a little drunk, and just think about life. It seems like our character was looking for something, but after getting inspired, he wanted to go for a walk in a quiet area. That's why we walk towards the floodlights, that's why there's nothing to do here. It also makes you wonder, obviously, what does it mean that those three guys found the light? Did they also get inspired as we did? Is there a darker implication here? Or is it just the fact that there are floodlights here, so they found the literal floodlights? I don't know. Maybe it's just an example of other people moving forward in their lives somehow, while we stand there wondering how they did it. It's willfully mysterious, I think, but let me know your theories. It's also a good moment to explain what I meant when I said that the smoking mechanic has a deeper meaning. It's completely useless, just like smoking in real life. And although many of us know that, we still do it. Smoking is also obviously associated with the whole doomer type of aesthetic, but in this case, I think it's used just to accentuate that it's a completely empty and harmful habit. It's just like everything else in the game. Junk food, pills, alcohol. It all gives us some kind of change in our stats, but it's all for nothing. And this moment, where we just have to stand for several minutes with nothing to do, is probably the situation in which we'll use the button more often just to have something to do. It's a moment in which the developer wanted us to reflect on everything we've been through, to ask ourselves, what the hell am I even doing here? At the end, the driver finally comes, we climb in his dingy car, and we get one less bleak monologue that really ties everything together. Куда? Домой? И что ты там будешь делать? Дома? Жарить картошку с колбасой? Пить водку в три часа ночи. А потом что? У тебя вообще есть работа? Или ты никогда ничего не делаешь? Когда тебе понадобятся деньги, куда ты пойдешь? Я вот работаю таксистом уже 10 лет. Я езжу по своим маршрутам с утра до ночи, всюду, где хочу. Иногда по несколько дней подряд. Я не помню, когда я начал работать таксистом. Просто так получилось. Вот и все. Я это делаю. И все. Ничего другого у меня нет. 
посмотри вокруг. Повсюду одно и то же. Мы все пустые и безжизненные. Боимся смотреть правде в глаза. Мы все очень устали. Очень устали. Все постоянно хотят развеяться, танцевать где-то всю ночь, а дома зализывать раны. Такая жизнь не может длиться вечно. Пора очнуться, пора кому-то себя проявить. Правда, не знаю кому и как. Это будет не твоя роль. Ты хочешь спать? Пожалуйста, спи. Я тебе не мешаю. Спи. And then the games are over. So, what does it all mean? Well, depending on what moment of your life you're in, you might have a different interpretation. Just like with poetry, literature and art in general. Me, being 25 and finishing up my university studies in what is allegedly a pretty useless field, and feeling the pressure of having to look for a job soon and basically fully starting my adult life, as they say, well, I feel like I very much get what the dev is going for. All this talk about being purposeless and doing nothing, of other people moving on with their lives and doing things the right way, so to speak. General bleakness of everything, time passing and youth becoming a distant memory. Then, in the midst of this, going for a night out as you've done countless times before, and seeing that each time it just seems to become emptier and emptier, that finding something which inspires you and makes you feel even slightly uplifted is rare. But even worse than that is the continuous brooding. The problem is not just that you feel lost and alone, it's that you might be wallowing in your supposed misery without even realizing it. I wondered, at a certain point when we got to the pharmacy and took the pills, if the place you're in is objectively dreary and falling apart, are you really at fault for feeling like shit? Are those pills actually going to do anything to change your outlook? Well, it's a hard question to answer. On the one side, the external influence of the place you live in is obviously a real thing, and it can be quite heavy. Just listen to any Midwest emo band, they'll tell you. At the same time, just like one of the level limits reminds us, the grass is always greener, right? It's an obvious bias that we still somehow keep forgetting about. I do feel that, to some extent, the idea here is that our own protagonist is just making things worse for himself. If you look at all the other level limits, they sound like something that he might be telling himself. It's along the lines of, everything is so shitty, so why even try? The last level is quite revealing in this sense. The limit says, you can't escape yourself. It confirms the simple fact that the real prison, first and foremost, is not in this garbage dump of a post-Soviet town, but it's the character's own mind. And it feels like some of the things that the NPCs say, especially these two girls with their desire for everything to end, is a reflection of his own thoughts. The driver at the end also symbolizes this. He puts us in front of our broken behavioral pattern, asking us if we'll just keep going through the same pointless routine every day, if we're not gonna do anything to move on. But most importantly, he also points out that everyone else is also tired. It's almost as if everyone is waiting for someone to finally come and change things up. But in the meantime, everyone is just going through their own routine. What I think he's trying to tell us is, you're not special, you're just like everybody else. And they're also not doing great, but at least they're trying to hold on, to actively live their life. What you're doing is detaching yourself even further from everyone, living a solipsistic existence, thinking you might be the only one with a consciousness deep enough to see how bleak everything is. And if you keep doing it, you're never going to escape this pointless cycle. We might play this game for the vibes, and sure, it has pretty immaculate vibes. But the ideal scenario here would be for us to actually get inspired in some way, just like our character gets inspired. Will it lead to any kind of answer? Maybe not, probably not, to be honest. But still, it may be a tiny step in the right direction. As we get the final screen that tells us the games are over, we might just get that little push to get off our computer and maybe do something. 
Niyasne obviously doesn't give us an answer on what to do. I also forgot to tell you that the game's name, Niyasne, means unclear. So, I think that's pretty telling. But I think it's safe to say that it points us towards creativity. What helps the developer might be exactly this, being creative and making games. What helps Ilya, maybe, is poetry. What helps me is making this kind of video. So, what helps you? You don't need to answer if you can right now, but at least take the question with you. Sooner or later, you might find it, and it will surely help you to find your light among all of the bleakness of this world. Thank you, and see you, space poets.